What's up, crispy dogs? Today, today, we're gonna learn about momentum. That was beautiful. I think I should go into to singing or something. If I'm not a teacher here next year, uh, it's because I made it big. Lil Nas X found me, and he asked me if I wanted to be on his new country album. So today, while we're waiting for his manager to get with my manager and them to sort out the details of my record deal, uh, we're going to talk about why my pen never works. Never. Not a single time has it ever worked. But we're going to talk about the conservation of angular momentum. So you heard it here first, folks. We've learned regular momentum. We've learned regular forces. We've learned spinning stuff. We've learned spinning forces. We've learned spinning masses. Now we're learning spinning momentum. So we're almost at the end. Um, we're going to talk specifically about conservation of angular momentum. And then we're going to look at kind of three different ways you might want to employ the tool of conservation of angular momentum in your own life. Um, you know, maybe you see a fine looking dude orbiting around you and uh, you uh apply a torque to the system and no never mind uh, this this analogy is falling apart real quick but anyway we're gonna learn about angular momentum so let's talk about it a little bit so we already talked about angular momentum being l equals i omega um but let's talk about what conservation of angular momentum means so much like linear momentum angular momentum in a closed system is conserved. So what that means for us as far as solving problems, setting up problems, predicting the motion of heavenly bodies, is that the total amount of angular momentum of the system is constant. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to say however much angular momentum there is at the beginning, that equals how much angular momentum there is at the end. And then you can do some math with that. We're not going to get too bogged down in the math because the AP test doesn't get way bogged down in the math. It gets a little bogged down, but you know, it's got some paddle tires on its math mobile and it'll be all right. It'll get out. So we're going to focus on the, the driving concepts and the setting up of the problems um, and what's physically changing about the system. And then we'll, we'll talk about the math because it's important. It's fun. We love math. But we got to keep the physics at the forefront. So there are a few ways that angular momentum can vary. The first way that angular mo momentum can vary is angular momentum. Uh, sorry, angular momentum can impart angular momentum. You guys, seriously, my editor's got to proofread these a little better. Linear momentum can impart an angular momentum on something. So if you have an object moving linearly and then it hits a thing that's fixed at a point but can spin, this whole rod can't continue to move linearly because it's, it's nailed down. So this linearly moving thing will hit this thing and this thing will spin, giving it an angular momentum. So a lot of times, Linear things will hit things that can spin and then they'll start to spin and then you've got an angular momentum. So we need to figure out how do I convert some sort of linear collision into an angular collision and we'll work on that today. The more interesting ones I think are we could have two spinning objects that run into each other and then because there's some forces at work they're touching each other, they're bumping into each other, there's a collision, they're going to transfer angular momentum to each other. The one that's got more angular momentum will give the other one some other angular momentum and it'll all come out in the wash and eventually the system will have a very similar angular momentum. It'll, it'll kind of homogenize itself. But we'll look at an example of that. And then lastly, 
Sometimes we use angular momentum for things that don't change or don't interact with something else at all. Um, we could have an object moving on its own. And then just because it changes its shape or position, it will change its uh, the way the angular momentum represents itself. The total angular momentum won't change. But if I if it suddenly starts spinning faster, there's got to be a reason for that. So we'll kind of dive into how does the shape of an object affect how fast it spins with the mindset of we're conserving angular momentum. So let's go dive into these three special cases. Let's look at a few examples um, and we'll get our fingers dirty on some math and we'll have a good time. All right. So first and foremost, let's look at a linear or an object experiencing linear motion colliding with an object that can only really experience rotational motion. So we have a bar initially at rest and it has a mass of M and a length of L. So the whole bar is L long. We don't really know how long that is. If you have a meter stick, you could figure it out, but that's your problem. Okay. The rotational inertia, this is a synonym for moment of inertia. Uh, while I was looking at some AP stuff, I noticed that they use this verbiage, rotational inertia, rather than moment of inertia. Uh, there's not really a difference. There's, there's synonyms. It's like in math, the difference between an x-intercept and a root. You're talking about the same thing, but there's different names because, you know, because. So the rotational inertia of the bar is given by the formula I equals 1 12th ml squared. So this is the formula that we had to look up for the moment of inertia of a rod spinning about its center. The bar is on a frictionless pivot at its center and is free to rotate. The ball of mass lowercase m hits the bar near the end and causes the bar to start spinning. After the collision, the bar is at rest and the bar spins around the pivot to start, uh, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, I lost my spot. I'm not a good reader, you guys. Uh, it spins around the pivot at its center. What is the angular momentum of the ball before the collision? What is the angular momentum of the rod after the collision? Okay, so we've got two problems here. Um, we want to know how much angular momentum does the ball have? Okay. At the beginning of the problem, the things that let's let's break it down a little bit just so we have some context. This ball is coming in hot. This bar is sitting there minding its own business. The ball hits the rod. Collision happens. The ball stops. After the collision, the ball is at rest. But the rod rotates like so. Okay. So before the collision, the only thing moving is our ball. So it's the only thing with any momentum, period, angular or rotational. Um, so we need to figure out what is the angular momentum of the ball before the collision? Does it have any? So in fact, it does. Let's take a look at it. Let's go back to some definitions and we'll make some substitutions and we'll play around with some equations. So the angular momentum of an object in general, the equation that we've been given is... I omega. Okay, let's break these two things down. Um, we don't necessarily know I of the ball, but we can figure it out. We have an equation for I. Let's take a detour here. I equals m r squared um, for a point mass, meaning a mass that's going around something with but it's got to be small compared to whatever R is. So it can't be too big. We'll, we'll hand wave it. We'll just say, you know what? However big this ball is, it's good enough for us. We're going to treat it like a point mass. So let's make this substitution. We'll substitute the moment of inertia for the ball for the mass of the ball times the distance from the axis of rotation squared. So 
uh, I will turn into M. And then this ball is hitting near the end. So we're going to say if this is L, the whole thing, we'll say that our ball hits at uh, L over 2 squared, right? The distance from here to here is half of L. Okay, so we have our mass times L over 2 squared. Uh, and then let's talk about omega. We have an equation that relates linear velocities to rotational velocities. That equation is V equals omega R. Um, so they don't tell us V, they just say it is moving. So we'll say that its initial velocity is just V naught. What, it's whatever, right? Um, and our R here is still the distance from the axis of rotation here at the center. So still L over two. So we can divide by R um, to get omega. So omega is V naught over L over two. And now let's do some simplifications here. Uh, this L over 2 can cancel one of these two L over 2s. So the angular momentum of this ball before the collision is M L V naught over 2. Okay. And this over 2 comes from the geometry of the problem. Let me maybe rework this without plugging in the lengths and the specific velocities. Um, I omega, we'll just replace it with uh, mr squared. So I is mr squared. Omega is v over r. The r's cancel. And the angular momentum, you might want to write this down. It's going to be important on your homework. Is mvr. So it's the linear momentum, the mass of the object times the velocity of the object, times the distance from the axis of rotation. That's pretty cool. Um, so there we go. We've got it. Um, keep in mind that we are handling a little bit here. Uh, this velocity technically needs to be the tangential velocity. It needs to be the velocity perpendicular to this thing here. So if our ball were, instead of going straight at it, maybe going at an angle, we might need to do a little bit of trigonometry to find the perpendicular component. But anyway, so the uh, angular momentum of our ball before it hits the rod is m l over 2 v naught, or simplifying the math a little, m l v naught all over 2. So this is the angular momentum. So if we knew the mass of the ball, how fast it was going, and how long this rod is, we could get a number for this. Okay. Let's talk about what is the angular momentum of the rod after the collision. So we know for a closed system, and we'll say this is closed. The things in our system here are the ball and the rod, and there's no outside forces, so we're not going to worry about it too much. Um, the, sorry, um, the sum of the angular momentum initially is equal to the sum of the angular momentum final. So our initial angular momentum is the angular momentum of the ball because it's the only thing moving. After the collision, the only thing moving is our rod. It says that the ball uh, is at rest after the collision. So if it's not moving, it can't have any momentum at all. So all of the final angular momentum must be the final momentum of the rod. So our angular momentum of the ball initially is mlv naught over 2. That's this right here. All of that momentum was transferred to the rod, and the rod will also have an angular momentum of mlv naught over 2. So it's the same answer for both of them.
All right, so that's how we can find the angular momentum of an object translating in a straight line, moving linearly, uh, not turning, just going in a straight line. And that's how we can convert these linear motions into rotational motions. So we've looked at the angular momentum of a translating object, and we've done a little bit of conservation of momentum to justify why they should have the same. Okay, let's talk about our next sort of scenario here. We could have two spinning objects, and then they're brought together so that they both spin. And we want to know what happens after they're done interacting. Um, this could be Beyblades, this could be um, maybe two ice skaters. One of them does like a, a jumping spin and the other one catches them. That's two spinning objects that then interact, collide, touch each other, and all these angular momentums need to be accounted for. So let's do a very simple problem. We have two identical disks, both with a rotational inertia, this is moment of inertia, I, of 0.25 kilograms meters squared. So I just give us a number here. We'll, we won't worry so much about what the radius and what the mass and all that junk is. One disk is rotating at 10 radians per second initially. This is an angular velocity. The other disk is rotating in the opposite direction with an unknown angular velocity. The two disks are brought into contact such that they're stacked and rubbing together until they are spinning in unison with the same angular velocity of two radians per second. What is the initial speed of the second disc? Okay, so let's look at a picture so we understand 100% what we're looking at. We have two discs, both of them have a moment of inertia of 0.25 kilograms meters squared. This bottom disc is spinning, uh, I've drawn it counterclockwise here, at 10 radians per second. It says this second disc is also rotating in the opposite direction with an unknown velocity. Okay. Then we take the two discs and then we lower them together until they're in contact and then they spin and rub on each other and eventually they'll quit rubbing and they'll just sort of stick suddenly. And then uh, they'll both be spinning together like they're one big disc. And that final velocity they're both spinning at is two radians per second. So we wanna know how fast was this rod spinning, be uh, not rod, pardon me, disc spinning before they came into contact. So let's look at this as a collision we have one spinning object spinning into another object. Their spins are gonna interact, cancel out a little bit, and then we get one final spin. This sounds like a conservation of momentum problem because we got two things interacting. Anytime there's a collision, it's probably conservation of momentum that we're looking at. So let's conserve some momentum. We have our uh, angular momentum initially will equal our angular momentum final. Let's break these two scenarios down. Let's look at initial first. Before they touch, both of them have an angular momentum because they're both spinning. This rod, sorry, not rod, disc, will have, we'll call it uh, L1 uh, plus L2, okay? And we'll call this one and this one too. Okay. So they each have their own angular momentum. One of them will be negative because it's spinning in the opposite direction, but not a big deal. Um, let's, let's just go ahead and preemptively make number two the negative one. We'll say counterclockwise is positive, and then clockwise is negative because we're right-handed. Okay, equals the angular momentum final, this is going to be, let's just call it one final angular momentum. They're gonna be touching each other. They're gonna be spinning together in unison. This is now effectively 
one really big disc spinning uh, that way at two radians per second. So we've doubled our disc and now it's just spinning slower. Okay, so let's start plugging in some stuff. Um, angular momentum is I times omega. Okay, so we just substitute them all for I omegas. Now we can start plugging in some, uh, some numbers. I for each disk is 0.25. So let's plug that in. So we have 0.25. Uh, our initial velocity for the first disk is 10. And then minus 0.25 times omega 2. And this is what we're looking for. Equals, let's talk about the, the final moment of inertia. I've taken two disks and I've smushed them together to make one big object. The, the intuitive thing to say is I doubled the size of the disk. I have doubled the moment of inertia. You need to be a little bit careful with this. In this case, this is a true statement because we're not changing how far away any of the masses from the axis of rotation. We're just sticking them together and effectively doubling the mass. So because the radius or the distance from the axis of rotation is the same, but the mass has doubled, this moment of inertia will be twice as large as initially. Let me caution you, we'll come back to this idea. And let me, let me make a note. Let's put a star here. Uh, I final, we'll come back and talk about that in a second. Okay. For this, it does double. So our final moment of inertia will be two times 0 0.5, uh, 0.25 is 0.5. And they tell us the final speed is two radians per second. All right, now we have our equation set up and this is just math. We finished the physics. The physics ended when we tricked ourselves into believing that this was twice as big as uh, either of them by themselves. Now we just uh, do some math. So 0.5 times two is one. Uh, 10 times 0.25 is 2.5 minus 0.25 omega naught, uh, sorry, omega two, two. Okay. Subtract here, subtract 2.5. So we have negative, 0.25 omega 2 equals negative 1.5. Divide both sides by uh, negative uh, 0.25. Actually, uh, yeah, by negative 0.25. Um, and then omega 2 equals um how many times is 0.25 going in this four five six six you guys i'm being sloppy here sorry i got bogged down in the math um sorry divide by negative 0.25 that goes away sorry these cancel omega 2 is six radians per second so this is going to go six radians per second in the negative direction. Um, so we could say negative six, right? Just to make it negative. It says the other disk is rotating the opposite direction. That's how we knew that. Um, if it didn't tell us this, we might want to be really careful about that. Um, and... Yeah, there's some other math. And we're not going to get bogged down in the math. Don't trip too much. It, the answer is uh, six ratings per second in the opposite direction. Okay, let's come back to this idea. Um, so like I said, this big single disk, once they stick together, has double the moment of inertia because the geometry is the same. 
This would not be true. Let's say we had maybe um, a rod here. And then we took a second rod and just glued it onto the end here. This new moment of inertia is 100% not double. Because even though they have the same mass, all of this mass, look how much farther from the axis of rotation it is than this mass. Because you have attached the same amount of mass, but way far from the axis of rotation, it's not double. I equals m r squared. The only reason we can say this one was double was because the distance from the axis of rotation was not changing. The only thing that changed was the mass of the total disks. So in this case, the mass has doubled, but the radius is also not in the same position. We would have to take this one and set it on top of this one for that to work out. So be very careful with the wishy-washiness of which I am doubling moments of inertia. Uh, I've checked it, this one works out, but that's not always the case and you should stop and give it some thought. Okay, last example. Uh, this one is very similar to a ballerina, not a ballerina, sure a ballerina, a ballerina is fine, but uh, a figure skater. Believe it or not, asteroids and figure skaters aren't all that different. Um, so let's read the question. An asteroid is about 12 meters across, um, is orbiting the sun in an elliptical orbit. Ellipses are ovals. So this asteroid way out here is orbiting our sun, uh, this giant glowing ball of gas that people once worshipped as their god. And it is orbiting in an ellipse. Okay. It could orbit in a circle, but many things don't orbit in consistent circles. Most of the time, almost 100% of the time, I'm sure almost nothing is actually a perfect circle. Most of the time, things are elliptical, if only slightly. The Earth is actually partially elliptical. Mr. Barton, is that why winter happens? Is it winter when the sun is farther from the earth? No, it's that's that's not the case. Uh, that's a misconception. Uh, winter happens because our earth is slightly tilted, right? Instead of being like this, our earth is like this. So during part of the year, the sun is just beaming like this. So the northern hemisphere, as it rotates like this, the northern hemisphere is getting hecka sun, while the southern hemisphere is getting like one little ray. Uh, as this goes around, whoops, as this goes around like this, now the southern hemisphere is getting hecka sun, right? So it's got more to do with the tilt of the earth than it does the distance. Distance is not why our uh, seasons happen, but I digress. Okay, back to the problem. Um, so we have an asteroid going in an elliptical orbit around the sun. Um, the asteroid starts out near the orbit of Uranus and is coming closer to the sun. Astronomers work out that the asteroid has an angular velocity, meaning it's... Uh, it's covering a certain angle. This angle here. It's covering a certain angular distance per unit of time. And it's omega naught. It's some number. We don't really care what the number actually is. It's some number. They measured it. It's in a book somewhere. You could Google it or ask NASA really nicely. Whoops. Go forward one. Okay. Once the asteroid has come closer... Uh, sorry, at, has closed about half the distance to the sun. So it was out here. Whoops, come on, asteroid. No, give me the asteroid. So once it was out here by Uranus, closes about half the distance and is now passing uh, Saturn. What will be the approximate angular velocity? So 
let's uh let's look at some stuff let's start with our conservation of angular momentum the conservation of angular momentum says initial angular momentum equals final angular momentum okay. if anything could ever be considered a point mass it is asteroids traveling through the cold uncaring void of space this asteroid is this asteroid is so minutely tiny compared to this distance that if I were to draw this to scale, I don't think my computer is a high enough resolution to show you how infinitesimally small this thing is. Uh, if an asteroid were about 12 meters across, then this sun would need to be like a state over for this to be an accurate to scale drawing. So it's a point mass by merit of R being like trillions of times bigger than the size of the actual object. So it's a point mass, okay? Which is important because we're gonna calculate the angular momentum, which means we're going to look at the moment of inertia times omega. Okay. Last video, I told you when we were looking at impulses and changes in angular momentum, we weren't really going to trip too much that day about changing shape of stuff or changing uh, moments of inertia because the masses weren't really going to change. And we were just talking about things spinning faster or spinning slower. Now, this thing is changing its distance to the axis of rotation. It's spinning around an axis here through the center of the sun, more or less. Um, so that axis of rotation is uh, moving. So let's explain why that's important. I, our moment of inertia is m r squared and r is the distance from the axis of rotation. So as our asteroid goes from here to here, this value is changing. The mass stays the same. It doesn't gain or lose mass as it comes closer to the sun. But this distance from the axis of rotation absolutely changes. So we need to consider the initial moment of inertia and the final moment of inertia because the shape of our system is changing and that will change how quote unquote heavy it feels when we're trying to spin it. So we need to look at initial angular momentum, uh, moments of inertia and angular velocities and final moments of inertia and angular velocities. The changing moment of inertia here is what drives the change in the angular velocity. So let's do some math. Uh, moment of inertia is m r squared. So we'll say that this initial distance is capital R. We then wait for the asteroid to close about half the distance. So this new distance is going to be r over 2. So let's start plugging some stuff in. Um, our initial moment of inertia is the mass of the asteroid times r squared times our initial angular velocity that the astronomers measured, omega naught. Okay. Equals, now here's the tricky part, m mass of the asteroid, r now, is r over two squared omega final. So let's solve for omega final and see how has this changed relative to omega initial. So let's just cancel these masses and clean this up a little bit. We have r squared omega naught equals square the r, square the two, r squared over four, omega final, cancel the r squareds, 
multiply both sides by four to get this over here. So four omega naught equals omega final. So if we take our radius and cut it in half, you end up going four times faster than you were initially. So if this thing was going, uh, I don't even want to make up numbers, but however fast it was going, it is now going four times as fast. Crazy, right? So just by moving something and changing its moment of inertia, um, we have sped something up. And this is because of the forces involved. And it really helps us avoid having to look at the forces. If we wanted to look at forces, we'd have to be looking at the force of gravity equals G M M over R squared. R is dependent on the time. R is changing. We don't want to look at a changing force, especially a changing force going around an ellipse too difficult. This lets us subvert all of that heavy lifting. We don't have to deal with ellipses. We don't have to deal with changing forces. We don't have to deal with any of that stuff. We just conserve momentum and we can figure out it's going four times faster. Beautiful. Okay. So that is the gist of our stuff. Actually, let, let's take one more quick side note. Uh, let's change colors. What do you want to look at? Mm, how about a blue? I haven't used blue in a while. How about this nice blue? Okay. Let's maybe just compare our moments of inertia. Okay. Our initial moment of inertia is m r squared. And our final moment of inertia is m r squared over 4. Whoops, come on. Got this. Final equals that. Okay. So they both have R, MR squared, MR squared. So let's just pull this four out and turn into a coefficient. This is I final equals one fourth MR squared. So if we take our initial moment of inertia and cut it into one fourth of its original value, because this went down to one fourth, our angular velocity needs to increase to four times its original value to compensate for that decrease. In angular velocity, if we decrease our moment of inertia, we need to increase our angular velocity uh, to make sure that this value stays constant. Um, another example that I'll, I'll talk about, but we won't do an example on, if you have a figure skater, uh, and let's say they, they kind of look like this. I didn't put nearly as much effort into this one as uh, the one before, but that's all right. Okay, and then maybe like they got one leg out uh, just to show off for their mom. Uh, there you go. Ice skates, got their arms out. And then they're spinning, right? They're going around in a circle. They're doing whatever this trick is called. Then they take their arms and they pull them in like this. And then they take their leg and they lower it. This mass has come in. This mass has come in. This mass has come in and his arm grew to four times as long, apparently. So the mass of the ice skater has stayed the same, but the distance from the axis of rotation has gone down. So our moment of inertia has decreased. When the ice skater pulls their limbs in, because their moment of inertia is decreasing, their angular velocity needs to increase to compensate so that their angular momentum stays constant. Cool. So if they pull their arms in, they're gonna spin way faster. Um, and you could go watch some videos, go YouTube it, figure skaters uh, spinning or something like that. Watch them, they'll go into the spin, arms and legs extended real smooth. 
And then the music will pick up and they'll slowly draw them in like a graceful ballerina swan duck thing. And then they'll spin like crazy and then they'll throw up all over the ice and it's super tight. Uh, but that's angular momentum. That's, that stuff's physics. So hopefully this was a fun, engaging, insightful, uh, miraculous, wonderful, invigorating, inspiring lecture. Um, yeah, go do some problems, kids. Go, go work on it yourself. Go explore the wonders of conservation and momentum. And until next time, have a wonderful day.